prepare to worship the Lord with singing and dancing. going to open in a word of prayer this morning. God, we just still ourselves before you right now. Lord, we just turn our attention to you. The author and perfecter of our faith, God. God, you're the only one who is worthy. And God, even this time of year, as we, it's a time of harvest, God, a time of thanksgiving, even as next weekend we move towards a Thanksgiving holiday. God, we just want to be in an attitude of thankfulness. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for sending Jesus, your son, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are a good father. We thank you, Lord, that you are forever faithful. God, you never change. You stay the same, God. God, nothing can separate us from your love. So, God, we just want to come this morning we want to give thanks to the Lord. God, because your love endures forever, Lord. You are a good, good Father. Lord, you are above all things, God. Lord, you are greater than any circumstance, God, or any challenge we can come across, God. God, nothing is impossible for you, God. And God, with you at our side, God, we can do all things. We can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength, God.
From the rising to the setting sun His love endures forever And by the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever
sing it if our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against us? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand against? What could stand against? What could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand again? What could stand again? What could stand again? Could be your great God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any
with expectation everything abandoned here to see the glory of our God lift our voice to heaven Jesus you're our anthem we celebrate the wonder of your love come with expectation everything abandoned we're here to see the glory of our God we lift our voice to heaven cause Jesus you're our anthem we celebrate the wonder of your
your goodness and your greatness, Lord. That all may hear, that all may see. How great is our God. How great is our God.
Jesus, Jesus. 
You worthy of it all. 
As soon as we started singing this chorus, the Lord took me to um, Colossians. And I just want to read a few scriptures from Colossians 1 to you. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So when we sing this chorus one more time, Pastor Stu, I just want you to, to think about that. All things were created by him. All things were created for him. You were created by him. You were created for him. So why don't we stand this morning and just give him the honor that's due to him as we just tell him how worthy he is of it all. Because you are worthy of it all. Yeah, baby. 
Tell him that right now. Father, you deserve the glory. Father, you deserve all the glory. We worship you, Lord God. You are glorious. You are beautiful, oh God. You are perfect in every way, oh God. You never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You will never leave us or forsake us. You love us with an everlasting love. You are a good, good Father. We give you all the glory, oh God. We give you all the glory. There is no one else that's worthy of the glory but you, oh God. We give you all the glory, Father. Forgive us for the times we've given other things glory. You deserve the glory, oh God. And we worship you. We worship you. We worship you only, oh God. While we were singing, we sang a couple songs about God being our hope. And I really sense there's some people in this room today that you really need an infusion of hope. You know that God loves you. You know that God loves you. But you just have lost a little bit of your hope. And when that, those two songs came out that talked about that, you had a tough time saying that. So if you just want to come forward and just have a little bit of time at the altar, we can pray for you. If you just need a little bit more infusion of hope. Barb, if you can come up. Linda, can you go down and pray for a couple? And just If you have other requests, you need some prayer for healing or those things as well, more than welcome to come up. But specifically, if you just feel like you need an infusion of hope, now is the time for you to come up, okay? Among us, and his 
glory surrounds us and this fire is falling as we sing and the Savior is for us and his love is victorious and revival is rising in his name we need your Holy Spirit fire burning ever brighter in our souls. Kings and kingdoms falling, hear your people calling. King of kings, we need a miracle. We need your revival. Holy Spirit fire burning ever brighter in our soul. Kings and kingdoms falling, hear your people calling. King of kings, we need a surrounds us and this fire is falling as we sing and the Savior is for us and his love is victorious and revival is rising in his name yes the King is among us and his glory surrounds Fire is falling as we sing. And the Savior is for us. And His love is victorious. And revival is rising in His name. Thank you. 
love of the Lord is always enough. Is that not true? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're just going to transition. We're going to do an offering in about 10 minutes or so. We're going to do our tithes and offerings. We're also going to include in that offering an offering for missions. As you know, Pastor Joe and Bella are taking a team of our young people, uh, I believe uh, Kojo and Danae and Joel and uh, Jared, who was here last week with Darren, um, are going to be going to Bulgaria on October 31st to do ministry to the young people in the gypsy camps in Bulgaria. So P Bulgaria has become a real passion for the pastor and his family, and so we want to support the work that they're going to be doing. So we all can't go, but we can all go with them with our prayers and our giving. So part of the offering this morning will be your tithes and offerings, but also will be an, um, a missions offering as well. So whatever you're putting into your envelope that's not your tithe, and you want to add something on the envelope for missions, just check off the missions and put the amount next to missions so we know how much to allocate to the Bulgaria trip. Um, but we're going to, before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of time to prepare for that. Before we do that, um, I'm going to call um, Barb and Linda. Um, we have a display over here uh, for Israel. Every year we spend some um, weeks praying for Israel. And so you're going to be getting some emails over the next few days with some prayers. We usually hand them out when we had the weekly bulletins. But we're going to do it by email this year. So you're going to get an email from the church, I believe, every day. And it's just going to be things that you can pray for specifically about um, Israel. I'm not going to tell them how to do that. I'm going to pass it over to you guys. I can tell them. Well, thank you, Pastor Lori. Wow. Another year has passed. Yay, yay, yay. In the Jewish calendar, it's uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the new year. I think it's 5777. Wow. That's a good year. And so it's such a privilege that um, our church has embraced the Jewish roots of our Christianity and that we do celebrate and come alongside our Jewish friends and neighbors. Um, and today, Barb is going to explain, for people that are new into the church, uh, exactly what we're going to do. We have a little bit of video, so hopefully we'll get that all connected at the same time. And uh, at the very end, um, we're just going to ask you to stand, and we're going to just read a prayer, but I just want you, your hearts to be in agreement with the prayer that we have written uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you. It, it started back uh, about four or five years ago, and it was something the Lord had put on my heart, and I really didn't understand. It came through with the Elijah list, and I looked at it once, and I looked at it twice. I looked at it three times, and said, whatever, whatever. But you know, God is very insistent. So about the seventh time, which is a very powerful number, I decided, I think we better tune in. So since then, we have uh, come together to do this uh, on October the 2nd, which is every October the 2nd. And so today, this is how we're going to begin. First of all, I'd like to explain the vision. It's not our vision, but we certainly stand beside it. It belongs to the day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, it was institu instituted with the endorsement of over 1,400 church leaders and Christian ministries from around the world, representing tens of millions of Christians. It's always held on the first Sunday of October. Our call is for sustained, fervent prayer, informed global intercession for the plans and purposes of God for Jerusalem and all her people. This global grassroots prayer initiative coincides with the season of Yom Kippur, recognizing the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. So we have uh, behind us, or we will have, um, why we should pray, why we should support Israel. So, uh, number one, this is in Genesis. God promises to bless those who bless Israel. I think that's one of the more familiar ones. So, we also are commanded. You can read that, actually, for yourself or even write it down and continue to read that at home. Number two, we are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And this is in Psalm 122.6, which is a very famous one. Number three, we are commanded to be watchmen on the walls of Israel, Isaiah 62, 6. Number four, we are commanded to minister to Israel in material things, Romans 15, 27. And I'm believing the day will come when we will actually either plant a tree or begin some kind of, many trees would be nice. <laughs> um, Number five, Jesus entreated the church to support Israel. Matthew 25, 40.
So there's a couple other questions people have asked um, outside of the things that God has commanded us to do, but even just as people living on this earth, why do we want to celebrate uh, and participate in this? Um, as soon as Barb moves my papers, I can tell you what we wrote. <laughs> okay. So, God's plan has always been for Christians to be grafted into the Jewish people. If you read in Romans 11 and Ephesians 2, we are to be one new man, Jew and Gentile. God's promises to the nations of Israel have not been canceled or nullified. The Jews are his people. Israel is still his land. That's why it's important that we boldly stand with Israel, especially right now at this time, because they're under attack from every side. Uh, in the last year, the Jewish people have been assaulted with thousands. Think about that. We were in Israel. We didn't see anything, but we know that while we were there, there was attacks going on. And we were blessed not to be part of any of those. But there are thousands of terrorist attacks, stabbings, car rammings, rock throwing, shootings, bombings, all resulting in numerous deaths and injuries. The Islamic terrorist organizations are increasing in frequency and intensity uh, with these attacks. Hamas is now, right now as we speak, digging tunnels under the border from Gaza. Hezbollah is growing stronger in Lebanon and Syria and is stockpiling missiles for their next war. That is a little scary. ISIS has infiltrated not only Syria and Lebanon, but also Egypt and Jordan. And I remember distinctly seeing Jordan when we were at the Dead Sea, and my comment was, that's Jordan? That's too close. It was a little shocking. It was across the water, and we could see it. It's really interesting. Um, and they're recruiting terrorists inside of Israel. Nearby Iran is threatening by testing ballistic missiles that actually have written on them death to Israel. On every side, there are hostile enemies who are making it very clear what their intentions are. And meanwhile, that's just, that's in Israel, but meanwhile, in the States, in Canada, there are actually world leaders who are condemning Israel daily, saying that they are actually the problem. Top officials, uh, in the U.S. and Canada, blame publicly blame Israel for causing the Palestinian terrorism and criticizing Israel def for defending herself. So the United Nations has issued several harsh resolutions against Israel this year alone. Right now, they are trying to pressure Israel into handing over control of the Golan Heights to Syria. We were there. Another scary thought. It's, it wouldn't be good. In these last days, we cannot ignore Israel's plight and expect the blessings of God upon our lives and our land. The Bible clearly st states in Isaiah 62, 1, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. And so there are so many, many reasons to stand with Israel, but especially today when there are hundreds of thousands of people, millions, who are going to be praying today, specifically the same prayers that we're praying. And you know, the Bible talks about the prayer of agreement. And it shifts heaven. And it shifts hell as well out of the way. So we are going to... Um, oh, I didn't get to see the slideshow. Oh, so cool. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Stu and Sarah. <laughs> so we're going to actually... What we did last year, Barb and I, we compiled all of the different requests that they have for Israel, the different uh, points that they want us to pray for specifically. And we just encapsulate it into one huge big prayer so that we just captured everything because that's the way we roll. Right, Barb? That's it. And so it was easier that way. And as Pastor Rory says, there will be prayers coming out or requests coming out. So just take a minute every day. And just lift, lift up Israel and know that as you do that, you'll be blessed and highly favored of God. And we don't do it for the blessing. We do it to be obedient. But that part of the obedience is that we're going to get blessed. So if everybody could just stand with us. And I don't know if Barb's going to read this prayer, or if I'm going to read this prayer, I'm going to read this prayer. If you just want to just even just enter in, as Todd taught us, enter in. I'm there. Are you there? Enter in and just be in agreement what these words say. Just close your eyes and just, just be in agreement. Father, thank you. Thank you that we worship a God who makes all things new, the God of restoration. As the psalmist writes, God more than restores souls. God's covenant with the land as well as with the people is everlasting. The promise that Israel will bud and blossom and fill the world with fruit. We give thanks for the restoration of Israel. We ask for houses of prayers 
to have an increased heart for Israel and for your purposes for the land and its inhabitants. We ask that you, God, will ra rise up, increase, and give courage to Christian watchmen in each nation. We pray Psalm 91 protection for those interceding for Israel. We ask your covering from any spiritual, spiritual retaliation from the enemy. Lord, strengthen the unity among all houses of prayer. We ask that you bring forth unity between Jews, Arabs, and other people groups to bring forth one new man. We also ask that you would dispatch angelic hosts to encamp around the land of Israel. Lord, we ask that nations would not be deceived, but would align with Israel. We declare godly wisdom for those who are bartering for peace. Let the whole of Israel know shalom will come from you and not from man. Lord, we lift you up and ask you to protect and give courage to the fair-minded Muslim who, who choose to speak up against radical Islam and jihad. We pray that Western democracies will not fall victim to the politically correct tolerance that allows jihad and cultural jihad to infiltrate government and legal systems. Lord, our cry is for the reconciliation between Christians and Jews and Jews and Arabs. We ask that the Christian Arabs who believe that, are finished, that you are finished with the Jewish people are awakened to your truth, that your, that your word says that you are not. Lord, we ask that you tear down replacement theology that is being spread to some Christian Arab communities. And we ask that you protect those Arab believers who do stand with Israel and who do serve you with Jewish believers as one new man in Christ. We give thanks that we serve the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We give thanks that your desire is to bring abundant life in every season, past, present, and future. Jesus, you were sent to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives. Today, we, as this church, we believe by faith that you are healing the Jewish nation from past wounds, past hurts, past pain by the power of the name of Jesus. May the joy of the Lord be the strength of Israel. May the Davidic anointing be graciously poured out over all Israel. We pray that new songs unto the Lord will bring deliverance, healing, restoration, and joy. Father, we pray Psalm 91, 4 to 6. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be like your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. We ask, Lord, for fair, honest, and moral clarity for all and any media coverage. Yes, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God of truth, and you will not rest until you make Jerusalem the praise of all the earth. Psalm 5-6 says that you destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men you abhor. So we ask in Jesus' name that anti-Semitism in Europe, Canada, Hispanic countries, on all college campuses, both here and abroad, will be broken and that the light of Christ shines into the hearts of all who are deceived. We bless you, Lord, that Israel will be redeemed. May you reveal yourself to them. We ask that you come and dwell in their midst. Ezekiel 36 tells us that the Jewish people are being brought back not because of their righteousness, but for the sake of your name. You promise to do certain things and you will fulfill them so that the nations will know that you are God. We pray for the safe return to Israel, all Jews, as you call them back from their captivity and all the places that you have driven them to. We pray for godly wisdom from Prime Minister Netanyahu and his administration. We pray for wisdom for the President of the United States and other democracies in the world that they would stand with Israel in her time of need. We pray for a strong alliance between America and Israel. Your word says that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who stands alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And three, a threefold cord is not easily broken. According to your word, you provide for all our needs. There are needs that we lift up to you today. Rain in the land, a healing love that only you can give to the Israeli youth who experienced war and terror since their birth. 
for the needy and the poor, the elderly and the homeless. We declare and proclaim over these needs, Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the accept acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Father, we thank you that you have heard our cry. And Lord, as we conclude this prayer, Lord, we just want to end it with the blowing of your shofar, the same trumpet that we as Christians and those Jews and those around the world who know you, when you blow that last trumpet, we shall arise with you. So thank you, Lord, as we just listen to the shofar being blown. And all the people say amen. amen. <laughs> they say, boy, that, that shofar makes the enemy go. So, hey, he's gone. So, Pastor Lori, we'll turn it back to you. Thanks, ladies, for doing that for us this morning. Um, this is a really good place to put in our announcement that we are taking a tour to Israel next November, November 2017. Um, so there are pamphlets in the foyer and at the back of the church with all the information about where we'll be visiting, um, the costs that it'll be if you're going by yourself, the cost if you're going with somebody else, um, the things that you'll need to take with you. Um, so if you're interested in going, Pastor Joe and Bella are taking a tour next November. So not, not like next month, but next year, 2017. And it was on the top of my bucket list to go to Israel. And I finally got to do it last year. And I got to tell you, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And if you, if you have any desire to go to Israel, it's, take, the, take advantage of this opportunity to do this. Um, we had an amazing time. We visited a lot of different places. And uh, you see the Bible differently because now you know where the, where the locations are. And so when, when you read in the Bible, you go, oh, I was there. I can actually see how 20,000 people could be sitting on that hill while Jesus taught. Because there are hills where 20,000 people would fit. There really are. So it'll just change how when you read the word, you see it. Plus just to walk where Jesus walked. And some of, the, some of the people got baptized in the River Jordan while we were there. Lots of really amazing experiences. It will definitely strengthen your faith and tap into what you need to know about our roots. It's a really, really good visit. So that's my announcement for Israel. Um, we're going to take up the offering. Um, so everybody ready? Do we have the declaration ready to go? We do. Awesome. I'm going to move over here so I can see it. I don't have it completely memorized. How about we stand? <laughs> That's okay. And we'll just uh, declare this. We've been declaring this for over two years now. I think it's two years. And uh, just seeing amazing miracles happen um, in the financial breakthrough for a number of our people in our congregation, as well as people who are connected to us because they are blessed because we are declaring this over our lives and the lives of our families. So why don't we declare this today? As we receive today's offering, we are declaring and thanking the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decreasing, blessing and an increase, Heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, visitation, and divine manifestations, anointing, gifting, and calls, position and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. 
Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Why don't you come forward with your offering? Again, this is ties, offering, and missions this morning. You are worthy of it all. Worthy of it all From you are all things To you are all things To deserve the glory You worthy of it all You worthy of it all From you are all things, to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Joe and Bella and Andy and Joel and Rachel left uh, yesterday um, for a week in Cuba. Um, I don't know if you saw their post on Facebook. They're headed into the eye of a hurricane. <laughs> He always says whenever he goes somewhere, there's always strong winds. So just, just keep them in prayer that not only are they protected from the weather, but they actually have nice weather. If you know Pastor Joe and Bella, they like to lie on the beach and just, you know, turn over, tan on the other side for a while and then turn back over. Um, so just pray for them as they're, as they're away this week. They'll be back next Saturday. He'll be here next Sunday morning preaching. And also, um, because Joel's away this week, uh, Pastor Stu and uh, Regina will be heading up the um, street ministry. So if you have any questions about that, just touch base with Pastor Stu because Regina's off sick this morning. So we can just keep her in prayer as well. And I, oh, and um, uh, we announced last uh, Sunday night that we were transitioning to uh, one Heaven Invading Earth weekend each month. So there are no um, nightly meetings during the week. We have Wednesday night soaking in prayer. So if you want to come out, we have worship music playing. Um, sometimes it's Pastor Stu and Sarah leading it. Sometimes it's just beautiful worship music on the, on the CD player. Uh, we really like it when Stu and Sarah do it. Um, it's awesome. Just come bring a pillow and a blanket and stretch out on the floor, on a pew, um, and just soak in the presence of the Lord, and then we come together for some corporate prayer. So that's every Wednesday at 7. Um, and, our, and our October, this month's Heaven Invading Earth weekend will be the weekend of um, 13th to the 16th. Is that correct? Um, it's the weekend after Thanksgiving, so not this weekend coming up, but the weekend after. And uh, Todd Bentley is going to be coming back and joining us for that weekend. So let people know that, that that's going to be happening. Uh, and I believe that's all our announcements. So we're going to transition into the Word. Um, so this morning, uh, I'm going to do, my friend, want, I, I sent a text to my friend saying, I'm having a really hard time settling on a topic this week, um, which isn't usually a problem I have. Usually the Lord just gives me one. And uh, so I gave her some of the options. I asked her what she thought I should preach on, and, and you don't want to hear what her topics were. So <laughs> <We'll> <laughs> she's in a little bit of a God is in a smitey mode right now. So, um, but um, we, so I said I had this topic, this topic, or a pre-Thanksgiving Thanksgiving message. And she said, I picked that one because I just want to hear you say pre-Thanksgiving Thanksgiving. So we're going to do a pre-Thanksgiving Thanksgiving message. That was for you, Lisa. Um, and so... Uh, Typically on Thanksgiving Sunday morning, we often will hear a message about being thankful. I don't know if that's what Pastor Joe will preach on next week. He doesn't always tie his message in with what's going on on the calendar, but I, he could. And a lot of times, I mean, I've even preached on Thanksgiving Sunday, and you, you do the traditional Thanksgiving Sunday service about things that we can be thankful for. And I'm sure if we went around the room, and, and people probably do this around their table on Thanksgiving dinner, go around the table and say one thing that you're thankful for, and we could probably all list the s same similar things. And I really could have done a message where everything started with an F. We're thankful for family, we're thankful for friends, we're thankful for faith, we're thankful for finances. We're, you know, I could have done that. You know how much I like to do alliteration. But, but the Lord led me in a different direction. And so this morning I want to talk about, while well, looking at the life of Joseph, 
I want to talk about three things that may not necessarily make it onto your thankful list, but are things that we are told in the Bible that we should be thankful for. So, th- th- so <laughs> it may not be the most popular one <laughs> this morning, but um, I really did. I, I originally was working on the message and took the word thanks and thought, oh, let's just do something for T and H and A and N and K and S. I wasn't going to do Thanksgiving. That was just too many points. But I thought I could do thanks. And T, the first one that I came up with was trials and tribulations. And I thought, well, that's a fun message. And <laughs> but that is the first thing that I want to talk about. So we're going to talk about Joseph. And we're going to talk about three things that you may not necessarily want to put on your things to be thankful for. But I, I really want you to, I want to encourage you to start to think about that. Because one, the Bible tells us to be thankful for these things. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it also keeps us from developing a, a, a spirit of bitterness or discouragement. If we can learn to be thankful for God in everything, regardless of what our circumstances are, we can, we can go through those situations with him much quicker and easier and with a peace and a gratitude that isn't natural. It's supernatural. But you have to make the choice. It is a choice to be thankful. It's, it's a step of obedience. The Lord does tell us. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. And we like to sometimes just, you know, blow by that one. I, I want to be happy all the time. I want to rejoice always. But give thanks in everything? Like, how do you do that? So we're going to look at the life of Joseph. Everybody knows Joseph, right? Joseph from, the, from Genesis. Joseph was uh, the 11th son of 12. He was, he was the favorite son of 12. Now, that statement alone would make Lori and her sister Kathy want to do RTF for the family, <laughs> right? Picking a favorite and letting everyone in the family know And he did this. His father Jacob let everyone in the family know that Joseph was his favorite by making him a coat of many colors and giving it to his son and letting him know why he was giving him the coat. So all the brothers knew that this son was the favorite. All of them. Now the Bible talks about the fact that the ten older ones really resented that. Now I don't know, it doesn't say whether or not Benjamin did. Benjamin was the twelfth of twelve. He was Joseph's younger brother. But the Bible's quite clear that the ten older brothers were not happy with the fact that Joseph was the son's, their father's favorite. And they made no bones about that, letting him know that they were, they didn't find that all that impressive to themselves. So when he got his coat, now the Bible starts talking about Joseph when he's 17. So I don't know what 17-year-old boys were like back in Joseph's day, but 17-year-old boys, yes, not always the smartest decision makers, right? It's one of the reasons why their, in- their insurance is higher for car driving than, <laughs> than girls, but we won't go there. So he's a 17-year-old boy whose father's just given him a coat of any colors to let him know he's their favorite son, and he has a couple of dreams. Now, I don't know that I would have necessarily shared these dreams right away, But Joseph was so excited with the two dreams that he got that he told all his brothers that I had a dream that in the dream I was this stalk of wheat and you were all stalks of wheat as well. And I stood tall and you all bowed down before me. They already don't like him. (laughs) And now he's telling them that God's telling him that they're all going to bow down before him. So they already have this festering wound of of sibling rivalry going on inside them, and now even God's picking them out as their favorite, or so they're interpreting that, right? And so they decide they're going to kill him. Let's just kill him. We'll just kill him, get rid of him. We don't have to deal with him anymore. But one of the brothers thought that was just a little extreme, so why don't we just put him in a pit, and we'll tell Dad that he died, and they sold him into slavery. So they do. They they put blood on on this coat, take it back to Jacob and say, your son, your favorite son has been killed. Meanwhile, they've actually sold him into slavery. And the people that now own him sell him to Potiphar in Egypt. I would say this is a trial and a tribulation, yes? Okay. So in the world we live in, 
you hear people always talking about how we have the right to. I have to stand up for my rights. I have to, st and so I have the right to be upset that someone sold me into slavery. I have the right to be angry and bitter about these things. But Joseph, it says that Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. And it also says that others knew that the Lord was with him. So if he was bitter and angry and resentful about being sold into slavery, they would not have commented on the fact that they could see the Lord was with him. Are you catching what I'm saying here? So he lived a life where he was grateful. I'm not saying he was thankful for being sold into slavery, but he was thankful that the Lord was with him through all of those trials. Because they, they continue. He gets, he gets to the point in Potiphar's house where he is second only to Potiphar. Because they recognize that the Lord is on him, and that he is, he is faithful in his work, and he's honoring in what he does, that, they, that he rises in authority in this household. And except for Potiphar himself, he has got the most authority in that house. That's quite something. He's a slave in this house. And yet, because he had this attitude of thankfulness and acknowledgement that the Lord was with him, he was able to rise in authority in this house. Now, he also came to the attention of Potiphar's wife, who thought this was a good-looking young man and thought she'd like to spend some time with him. But Joseph was an honorable man and was not interested in this and would not succumb to any of this temptation. And he ran away from her the one day and left his cloak behind. And so she accused him of attempted rape. And her, hu and her husband threw him into, into jail. Now, you could then go, okay, come on, God. Like, I've been sold into slavery, right? And, I, and I, I know you're with me, and I've been honoring you and honoring my master, and I've risen up in authority, and now I'm in prison for something I didn't do. Again, the Bible says that the Lord was with him, and the people recognized that the Lord was with him. How? Because he continued to maintain that attitude of thanksgiving, that the Lord was with him. And again, in the prison, he rose to a high level of authority. He's a prisoner. And they recognize that the Lord's with him, and they recognize that he has something that they want, and they give him more and more and more authority and more and more and more privilege while he's in prison. Now, while he's in prison... I'm still on trials and tribulations, okay? So while he's in prison, a, a baker, I can't remember, it's not the candlestick maker, I don't remember this, cupbearer. The baker and the cupbearer are thrown into prison, and the two of them have dreams, and we already know that Joseph knows how to interpret dreams, and both of them are a little stressed out by their dreams, and so they hear that Joseph can interpret, so they come to Joseph with their dreams, and the one... The, Joseph tells him that in three days, the king's going to rescind your, your crime and you're going to be taken back into um, his, his household. And the other one, you're, you're not. And in fact, you're going to die. And, and that happened to both of them. He interprets the dreams correctly for both of them. And the one that's going to go back into the, into the Pharaoh's household, Joseph says to him, please just remember me to the Pharaoh. Let him know that I'm here. And the guy says he will. And he doesn't. Two more years go by, he's still in prison. Then the Pharaoh has a dream. And it's only after Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dream, the Pharaoh brings him out of prison, and it continues to say that the Lord was with him and that people recognize that the Lord was with him. So it is possible to be thankful in the midst of trials and tribulations. Now, I have had trials and tribulations in my life. I know all of us have had trials and tribulations, some to a greater degrees than others, but we've all had to face things that are difficult to go through, that they're, fit, they're physically difficult, they're emotionally difficult, sometimes spiritually hard to go through, and sometimes we try to go through it in our own strength, and we get bitter, or we get angry, or we lose hope. Um, and the Lord wants us to know that if we can learn to be thankful in everything, including when we're going through a trial and tribulation. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if you're going through a trial to be, like if you have a health crisis that you're thankful for whatever illness you have. But you can be thankful for the fact that God is in control. 
You can be thankful for the fact that the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. You can be thankful for the fact that he is your healer. And it's a choice that we make. We can, we can make the choice to be bitter and, and, and mad at God, or we can make the choice to be thankful that he is the same yesterday, for today, and forever, that he'll never leave us or forsake us, that he goes before us. All the promises of the Bible, either we believe that they're true or we don't. And, in the, and it's when we're in those moments of crisis, those moments of trials and tribulations, that we really need to call on those promises and choose to, as Thessalonians says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. I don't want to give thanks, but I've taught, I've learned how to make that choice because it's different. When we first got saved, I was a teenager, and we had, a, we had these books, my mother had these books called um, Power of Praise, and it's a similar concept, is that you just learn to praise him regardless of what your situation is. The situation may not change, a lot of times it will, but your way of dealing with that situation, your attitude throughout that situation will change, which gives you the ability to go through it. Let me give you some, some scriptures to back up what I'm talking about. James tells us this, James 1, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, okay, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you, when you, cons- when you not if, He doesn't say if you encounter various trials. He says when. Jesus even told us, you're going to encounter difficulties. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. One of the greatest things that we can be thankful for as believers is that Holy Spirit resides inside of us. Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, resides within you. We have everything we need to walk through these trials and tribulations with thankfulness. We really do. James 1, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The trials and tribulations create something within you. Now, I was really, really bad at art. In, class, in school, like the art class, hated art class. Everyone loved it. It was like, like, it was like an easy class. Give me a math class any day. I did not like art because I could not create anything. I mean, I could see it here. It just did not come out of my hands. I remember having to do pottery. Remember doing pottery in class? Yeah, and you had to mold it. My, my mother still, I think she still has it. It's a terrible looking. Actually, one year, one year, I'm going to age myself here. One year, <laughs> I didn't get a very good mark, but it was the best thing I ever created. I did a pet rock, because <laughs> you really can't screw that up. <laughs> anyway, but there's a process in pottery where after you have formed it and, and whatnot, it has to go into the kiln and it gets fired up. I don't think the pottery enjoys the process. It's pretty hot in there. It's really hot in there, but it's an integral part of the perfection, of the, of the producing of perfection. Even the little flaws create the, the, what, what is really perfect in, our, in an artistic way. And so when we go through a trial and a tribulation, the Lord is producing in us endurance, which we're not going to get when things are going really well. Um, uh, a lot of times when a, a, a sports team, and I'm going to do a sports team analogy again, but when a sports team has a bad game or, or does something, you know, if, you, if you, maybe you miss a shot, it gives you the determination the next time to do better, right? So you learn from your mistakes. If, it was, if every time was really, really easy, you would get kind of lazy about it. It's, it's, the, it's the drive to be better. And so trials and tribulations produce in us endurance. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under, the, under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And Romans 5 goes into even more in-depth uh, description of what trials and tribulations will produce in us. It, it says, I'm going to start at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations. We're we're thankful, 
right? We, we exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation and trials bring about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So trials and tribulations will produce in you perseverance per, and, and develop your character, produce hope, and love. So there's a purpose behind it. Now God's not, cre- not, God's not giving you the trials and tribulations. We, we live in a fallen world. There, are, there is sin in our world. There, are sin, there is sin in our world. And so decisions that people make affect us. God uses those things to perform these, these, this in us, endurance. He allows it, but we live in a fallen world. We are responsible for the decisions we make and the reactions we have to what's done in us and around us. What we do has consequences. And the Lord can take those and he can build within you um, perseverance and proven character and hope and love. In Isaiah 43, 1, it says, Do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, it says when, not if. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. These are the promises that we hold on to when we are able to say that we are thankful for the trials and tribulations that come into our lives. Yes? Yes. So when those things happen, we can, be, we can say with the, the writer of Thessalon- Thessalonians, Paul, that we are thankful in all things because we know that we're going we're gonna to have our character. There are things that are going to get rough, um, shaven off our character that need to be perfected in us. There's going to be things, we're going to come stronger. Um, many of you know I worked at a domestic violence shelter for almost 20 years, and the 22-year-old that went into that, into that job was very quiet, very shy, terrified of everybody who lived in that building. (laughs) And for three months would sit in my car and pray and say to God, please don't make me go in there. But he, I honestly do not know who I would be today if the Lord had not led me to work there. Because it, it, it created perseverance in me, it created endurance in me. I couldn't not go in. I had, I had bills. I had a job. I had, a, I had commitments. And, and I became really good at my job, but it took me some time to trust that the Lord was in it because it was so outside my natural ability and my training. But it produced in me character and endurance and perseverance and hope. And every time we exercise our faith, every time a trial and tribulation comes along and we get through it, because the word says we'll go through it, the psalmist says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't camp there, but we walk through it, that we know that the Lord is making us stronger and it prepares us for the next stage that we're going to go through. We get lots of really good times, but we do get trials and tribulations. And we know Romans 8, 28 We all know that verse, that God works together for good for those who love God. And sometimes we just don't like to hear that verse because a lot of times it gets told to us when we're right in the midst of the crisis. (laughs) Like, yeah, I know that. Just don't tell me that right now. But if we learn to to recognize the truth of those things, then we we can, like Joseph, be thankful that the Lord is with me in such a way that others will recognize it in you as well. And that's, sometimes that's the greatest witness we have. Um, those, those first few months at the shelter, I mean, I almost quit I don't know how many times. But I think of all the things that I did in those 20 years and some of the people that I, that I ministered to and people that I witnessed to and people that got saved and who, who, who lives got transformed because I persevered and allowed the Lord to... To, to strengthen me, to allow, allow the Lord to rub off those or shave off those rough edges. We had a, we had a staff member, I don't usually lose my cool very often, doesn't happen that often, and every once in a while, someone will come along that can push that button, and we had this one staff member that could push my button like nobody could, and it wouldn't really matter, and I just, and I knew that there was something in me, because I had learned this, I knew there was something in me that the Lord wanted to deal with. I remember going into my friend's office and saying, 
saying this to her, I know there's something in me that the Lord wants to deal with. I wish I could figure out what it was so we could get it over with, and she could just go away. Which it wasn't really the point of the whole thing. I mean, I worked through whatever it was, and then she stopped being able to push my buttons. But there are people that the Lord will bring into your life. There are trials and tribulations that the Lord will allow that will produce endurance and character and hope and love. So the second thing I want to suggest that we add to our gratitude list is when the Lord decides, when the Lord invites us out of our comfort zone. Don't you love when the Lord invites you out of your comfort zone? Yeah? Does, does he do that to you? Or am I just the only one? Yeah. So we don't grow. We don't grow in a healthy way in our comfort zone. If we get too comfortable, let's say in the natural, you sit in your comfy chair and you eat your, you eat your comfort food and you never leave that spot because you're comfortable. In the physical, you'll get fat and you'll, and, and you'll lose stamina and you won't have strength. Um, and so it's the same in the supernatural, same in our spiritual walk as well too. It's important that we don't get comfortable where we are. I remember having a pastor say one time how proud he was that people came into his church and were comfortable. And I knew what he meant, but it always bothered me because I don't think the Lord wants us to be comfortable. Because we don't grow when we're comfortable. He'll let you be there for a while because we all need those times of rest. But he will always invite you I was going to say push you, but you know what? He doesn't push. He invites you to step out of your comfort zone. Now, he will be, as Barb said, insistent about it. So you can say no, but he'll just ask you again. Just keep asking you again. So you might as well say, okay, yes, I'll do that. Um, now, Joseph isn't the best example for that because I don't know that, you know, he, he got moved out of his comfort zone, but he was going through major trials and tribulations. I mean, he went from slavery to prison. But... Take a look at Moses. Moses spent 40 years on the backside of the desert, uh, and he was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, and he was probably quite comfortable. He had a wife and some kids and a job, and the Lord comes to him in a burning bush and says, hey, Moses, I have a job for you. I'm inviting you to come out of your comfort zone. And Moses at first said, I, yeah, I don't think you want me. I can't speak, and I can't do this, and I, I don't want to do it. But he did eventually do it. And you look at what Moses accomplished by being willing to step out of his comfort zone. You take a look at Gideon. Gideon was going to war. He had thousands of men in his army. And the Lord said, I want you to take 300. Now, that's an invitation to step out of your comfort zone. Yes? Lord, I think I'd be a little bit more comfortable if I had like 30,000 men as opposed to 300. But he wants us when he invites us out of our comfort zone to stop relying on our own ability to do things, to stop relying on what we've accomplished from being invited to that position in the first place, and to rely fully and truly on him, more and more on him than on our own ability. Because we have the ability to do things. He's given us the ability to do things. He's given us the smarts to do things. He created us with brains and, and, and abilities, but ultimately he wants us to trust in him. And, and if you're in a place where you're comfortable in your, own, in your own ability, you don't need to rely on the Lord. So he'll invite you to step out. I, I've talked to a couple people who said that they've been going to the street ministry because it's so outside their comfort zone. And it's, a, it's challenging to them to step out and allow the Lord to work through them. When we step out of our comfort zone, we see the Lord do incredible things. And he, and he again, will produce in us perseverance and endurance and character and hope. And we'll, and we'll grow in and in, in extra because you're exercising your faith. And when you exercise something, what happens to it? It gets stronger. If you don't exercise it, it doesn't. It loses its power. It loses its effectiveness. Peter was somebody that stepped out of his comfort zone. He got right out of the boat. Uh, I don't. I don't know that uh, there was no one else in the boat that got got out of the. We did a study a few years ago by John Ortberg called. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat, right? So, you, so God's going to invite us to step out of our comfort zone, step out of those areas where we're comfortable. And you look at the, the 12 disciples. Jesus called 12, 12 men who were fishermen and tax collectors and ordinary men with families and jobs to follow around the creator of the universe and watch him do miracles and signs and wonders and then to do them themselves. These were men that really got invited out of their comfort zone. And after 
uh, Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension back into heaven, when the Holy Spirit came down and infused them, these now 11 men plus other disciples changed the world because they, they stepped out of their comfort zone. So when the Lord is asking you to step out of your comfort zone, he's doing it for a purpose. He wants you to grow. He wants you to come stronger. Um, I want to tell you a, a quick story. Um, when I worked at the shelter, I was... Um, I had been there about 10, maybe 12 years at this point, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, our director at the time was going on mat leave, and I was a frontline counselor, so I worked two weeks nights, two weeks days. I didn't have any management responsibilities. I came in, did my job, worked with the women, and went home, and that was, and that was comfortable. It was awesome. And I had come to a point where I was no longer terrified of the, of the people anymore, and I was good at my job. And um, when she was going on mat leave, Everyone's expectation was that I would step in and do her, I would be the director for her mat leave. And I really didn't want to do it. This was way out of my comfort zone. And, but I had this experience of every time I got comfortable in something, the, the Lord would move me out of it. He would invite me to step into something a little bit more difficult. So I assumed this was probably going to be the case. But I didn't really want to know because if once I knew for sure that the Lord was saying yes, then I had to do it. So I just didn't ask. <laughs> so you know a pregnancy goes nine months, right? So we find out when she's about two or three months pregnant that she's going on mat leave. So I've got five or six months where I literally stressed myself right out about this. And when it came down to it, um, there was um, a, week, a, a day that my boss called me into her office and she says to me, if you have any difficulties with the job while I'm on mat leave, feel free to call me at home. Now, She's eight months pregnant now, and nobody in management has ever spoken to me about taking this job. All my coworkers assume I'm going to do it, but nobody in management has said anything to me. This is the first indication that management actually thinks this. And I said to her, I said, I'm, I don't know that I actually want the job. Um, I don't know that I'm the right person for the job. Um, so the look on her face was like, complete and utter panic, because I think they just assumed I was going to do this. So I went away for the weekend and thought, okay, I better, I better ask God. I need to get, if, if this is where God wants me to go, I better get on board, and if it's not, then I need to know that, because I'm just making myself sick to my stomach. So I, had, I had prayed about it, and the Lord said no. And I was, like, really excited. And I had incredible peace about it. So when my executive director called me and said, I understand you have some concerns about the job, and I said, actually... I don't. I, I don't think I'm the right person. I've prayed about it, and I really don't think I'm the right one. And I had a really cool dream about it. I'm not going to go into that now. I don't ever usually get dreams, so this one was really pretty powerful. And, um, and so my, why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you a story about me thinking the Lord was going to take me out of my comfort zone and the Lord saying no when I'm trying to teach you to be, to be grateful when he does do that? Because you need to make sure that the Lord who's inviting you out of your comfort zone Everyone else assumed that I was, it was my turn to do that. I ended up doing that job four, years, four or five years later. But at that time, it was not what the Lord wanted. And just because it feels like it's out of your comfort zone doesn't necessarily mean that it's the Lord who's in it. So that's why you need always to listen to the voice of the Lord and hear the voice of your shepherd. What is he saying to you? Because you don't want to get out of your comfort zone into something that's not what the Lord's leading you into. And that's why I wanted to bring that up. Because my, I had to learn that because I just assumed the Lord always takes me out of my comfort zone. This is out of my comfort zone. It must be the Lord. Until I finally asked him, you need to stay in communication with your Lord and Savior. Amen? Yes? So, I, w I want to read a couple of quotes I saw this week. Um, Vanessa posted on Facebook this statement that says, when it feels scary to jump, that is exactly when you jump. Otherwise, you end up staying in the same place your whole life. The Lord doesn't want us to be stagnant. He wants us to grow. He wants us to become more and more like Jesus. And we do that by stepping out of our comfort zone. And there was a, a gentleman who wrote an article about um, getting out of your comfort zone. He had a whole bunch of points that I'm not going to go into. But he says this, your comfort zone can be an enemy of your future, a hindrance to your success, a stumbling block to your destiny. If you stay in your comfort zone, you will never leave nor surpass your current reality. His name was Harold Herring. So the first one was trials and tribulations, and the second one is being invited out of your comfort zone, things that you might want to add to your Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving list. And the third one 
is when you ask the Lord for something and he gives you my least favorite answer. It's not yes. It's not no. It's wait. Right? Wait. Who loves to hear the Lord say, wait? I, I love when the Lord says yes. I don't love when the Lord says no, but I know he has a purpose and a reason for it. I also know that for, for wait, but at least with no, I have an answer. Wait kind of means like, does that mean I'm going to get a yes eventually? Does that mean I'm going to get a no eventually? And he'll say, wait. Um, I know Annie Barb won't mind me sharing this because she's shared this story, but she was waiting on the Lord for something and she asked him for some direction and she went all the way to Hawaii on a conference with uh, about six people from the church, Pastor Joe and Bella, Joshua Mills School of Supernatural. And she, was, she got there and she asked the Lord the question and the Lord said to her, wait. And she's like, really? I've traveled all these thousands of miles for me to get the word wait? But when she did... The blessings that came out of that were amazing. And so, yeah, we don't like to hear wait, but it is something the Lord wants us to learn to do, is to wait on the Lord. All of these have to do with process. I mean, we've been learning about process for a number of years, have we not, from Pastor Joe? All of these have to do with embracing the process. Don't abort the process. Let the Lord take you through the process. When we get to the promised land, whatever that is for you, Oftentimes, the journey to get there is way better than what you're waiting for. I'm not saying what you're waiting for is not great. It's great. But what you learn and what you accomplish in that time of waiting is invaluable to your spiritual growth. Yes, the Lord could go and give it to you right this second. But how much more will you learn about yourself? How much more will you learn about your Savior? How much more will you learn about your relationship? How much deeper will you go into intimacy with him when you accept the answer of wait? And wait's not just sitting in your comfortable chair and doing nothing. It's being productive while you're waiting. But trusting that his reasons for having you wait are for your good and for your future along with the trials and tribulations and the, t the comfort zone issue, is to help to make you more like Jesus. And so this Thanksgiving, this week, from today until next weekend, is the week before Thanksgiving. Now, we need to be thankful all year round. Like, Valentine's Day is a day where you, where you recognize love. We need to love our spouses all year round. Like, Christmas is the time where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. We need to celebrate the fact that he came to earth all year round. Same with Resurrection Sunday. We need to celebrate all year why he came and died on the cross for us. The same thing with Thanksgiving. We need to be grateful every day for family and friends and, and for our faith and that he's a good, good father and that he saved us from our sins and he changed our lives, that he's healed us, he's provided for us. Get, let us live in a great country and have, you know, all those things that are really good things that we want to thank him for. But this week I want to challenge you to take a look at your walk and say, have I, been great, have I been thankful for the Lord when I was going through a trial and tribulation? If you're going through one right now, how can you start to thank him for what he's teaching you through that? How can you be thankful in all things? If he's asking you to come out of your comfort zone, if he's asking you to wait, I challenge you this week to examine those things and start to add them to your list. Like I said, it's a choice we make. We can choose to be thankful or we can choose to be really upset that we're going through something and allow it to make us bitter and discouraged or whatever. I'm not saying that, th that, those, things are gonna be, that those things are good things, but they can be used for good in us. I'm not minimizing the trial and the tribulation that you're going through, but I'm saying that in the midst of that, you can have an attitude of thanksgiving because your Lord never changes, that he's in control, that he's going to walk you through it. So that's my challenge for you this week. Start to add some things to your Thanksgiving list that maybe you wouldn't have necessarily put on your list before. Um, and so I just want to say bless, bless you to all of you. If you the, uh, Pastor Stu is going to come up, and we're just going to close with some worship. If anyone wants some prayer, you're more than welcome to come up to the altar, and um, we'll pray for you at the end of the service. I know we did it earlier, but... The altars are always open. 
And so, again, reminder this week, Wednesday, soaking and intercession on Wednesday at 7. Uh, street ministry Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We talked to Pastor Stu. He and Regina are going to be taking care of that. Keep the Garcias in prayer as they're having a wonderful vacation and for traveling mercies and protection while they're there and on their way back. And no nightly meetings until a week Thursday. Okay? Why don't we just stand up and close in prayer? Father, we worship you. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, that as we spend this next week in anticipation of Thanksgiving, Lord God, that we would re-examine those things in our lives that we are thankful for and maybe need to start making decisions and choices about being thankful for. We thank you, Lord, that you are the everlasting Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are in our lives and that you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Lord, that nothing that we can do will take us away from that love. That you love us more than we can possibly imagine. That you are wanting to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine in each of our lives, in our families' lives, in our community, in our city, in our church, in our country, Lord God, in our world, in Israel, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that we can bring everything that we have to you and know that you will listen, that you love us, that you have, you have the best plan in place for us. And so, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you do. And we thank you for what you're going to continue to do in us and through us. And we give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome week, everybody. And if you want prayer, come on up. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing Love endures forever For the life that's been reborn Love endures forever